So welcome back to another day of Math 210. Well, we're close to the end. Uh, we've, for the most part, completed the class. Our final exam is coming up on Friday, or I will review for that more on Wednesday. I do have some more material that I can show you today, uh, basically from section 5.8. I think it would be nice to uh, close out this course completely finishing uh, chapter 5, so that when you go into Calculus 2, uh, you'll be in a good space when, when the instructor quickly reviews the substitution rule and then, and then moves on. But before I do that, uh, I want to ask you, are there any questions that you have for me that could be about any test, any exam, any topic from the entire semester that you'd like me to talk about or address before we get going? Happy to do so. Hearing no questions for the moment, I'll give you some new material. Um, test grades, yeah, uh, by Wednesday, by Wednesday for sure. I spent Sunday um, doing all the grades for the academy classes, and I'm definitely late on those tests, but I'll definitely give you grades back by Wednesday for sure, so that you'll have that information going into the final. And we'll do a quick attendance mark so I don't forget later on. Okay, cool. Right, so I just want to make a clear uh, a few further integral formulas that are consequences of things that we already know, but we haven't like formally talked about them. And, and this first one is actually pretty cool. And it also solves mystery that we talked about uh, earlier on in the course. So that is to say, when I introduced the number e earlier on in the course, I didn't give you a formal definition for it. Uh, I just kind of explained it a little bit. I did mention a little bit of the historical context. Uh, I'm not going to continue historical context, but, but I will give you a way to define natural log and e to the x from very first principles, and I can do that with integrals, and it's kind of it's kind of a cool perspective. So I want to I definitely want to share that with you, with you now. And so it starts with the following thing. So if I want to do the integral from a to b of one over x dx, it, and uh, 1 over x is continuous function as long as x is not equal to 0. So if I pick like positive numbers, then, then this will work. Or if both a and b are negative, then, then this will work. But let's just say they're positive for now. And I would like you to please calculate this, this integral. Please take, uh, you know, 15 seconds or so. You see that on the exam, what's your answer going to be? Look, after giving you a moment to think, 
um, we, we should remember that an antiderivative for natural log of, for, for one over x is natural log the absolute value of x. And then we evaluate that from a to b, which in this case is natural log of b minus natural log of a. And then using those uh, logarithm rules, this is going to be equal to natural log of b over a. So in other words, the integral of 1 over x from a to b is the natural log of, of b over a. Why does this logarithm rule make sense? Um, the output of a logarithm function, you could think that that should be an exponent. So logarithms behave like exponents. So when you have something to the power over something to a power, you will subtract the exponents. So like just FYI, I guess that's like a like maybe an intuitive way of why the, that logarithm rule is true. Of course, there's formal ways to show it, but that's, you know, the, the purpose of today's lecture is not to explain the logarithm rules. Um, now, using this formula, I can take maybe a equal to 1 and b equal to some unspecified number x, like some fixed but arbitrary constant x. And so then I can look at the integral from 1 to x of 1 over t dt. And so what is this doing? Like, like if you graph 1 over t, and here's t equals 1, maybe you've picked some other number x. What this function is that I'm drawing here is maybe like a capital F of x, this you know, area under the curve function. What this function is, is for any input x, it's going to give you the area under the curve 1 over x from 1 to x. And in fact, we have a formula for it. The answer is natural log of x over 1. So that the integral from 1 to x of 1 over t is equal to natural log of x. And that shouldn't surprise you, because by fundamental theorem of calculus part 2, um, this is an antiderivative of 1 over x, and so is this. And any two antiderivatives of 1 over x must differ by a constant. In this case, those two antiderivatives are equal to each other. OK, that's fine. But you can actually reverse this. So you can turn this around and take the left-hand side as the definition of natural log of x. And so many pure mathematicians actually do this. So I'll note that you don't need uh, exponents or natural logs to define the Riemann integral. You just need to, you know, take a partition and, you know, do this rectangle business and find the area under the curve, take a limit. So you can define a natural log of x to be this integral, this area under the curve, 1 over t dt. You, you can literally take that to be your definition. And this is an increasing function. It's easy to see that it's increasing from the, from the picture because if you increase x to some bigger number, x1, then what you're doing is you're adding more area to it. So the value of the function is getting bigger. And every function from, you know, every function on the real numbers that's increasing will have an inverse. And so you could then define e to the x to be the inverse of, of natural log. 
so once you have the machinery to take, you know, to define like what is an integral, you can like define these concepts really, you know, really nicely. Here's straightforwardly the definition of natural log, and then e to the x will be the inverse of that. And then it's actually, you know, we were talking about those logarithm rules. Like it's actually kind of a fun game or kind of an interesting thing to derive the logarithm rules starting with only this definition. You know, in pre-calculus or in high school, what you would do is you would talk about exponents of like whole numbers or integers. Uh, then you would sort of gloss over the fact that that the exponent could be any real number. You, usually you illustrate those exponent rules for just the whole number case. And um, then you might use that to get uh, logarithm rules from it. But it's, it's an interesting proposition to actually take this formal definition and then derive those rules from the, from the formal definition. Again, that's not the point of this, this lecture, but like I point that out to you. And if you go look that up, if you write it out for me, I'll definitely give you some, some extra credit. I think it's interesting. If you think it's interesting too, then, then get in touch. So at least that solves the mystery of like what's natural log. Oh, oh and by the way, so how do you define E then? Uh, that would be like taking X equal to, to one in this equation, uh, or it would be like taking X equal to E in this equation. Well, If e to the x is supposed to be the inverse of natural log of x, then we we would want it to be the case that number e is a number such that natural log of e is equal to one. So here's a way you can use this to define the number e. You can you can make this definition. You can say e is the number. Um, such that The area under one over x from one to is equal to one. So, in other words, you can you can make the characterizing property of E be the fact that um, it's whatever value you need to make this um, area equal to one. So it's whatever value you need to make natural log of uh, E equal to one. And so you can like, you can then kind of investigate that numerically. You know, there, once you have this definition and you know that there does exist an inverse, then you can in theory prove that E does exist, but you can also investigate it numerically, and I'll show you a little bit of that now. Like I can go to Desmos and I can look at y equals one over x. And I can Let's see if I can do this. Like, let's see if I can take f of x equal to the integral 1 to x of over t dt. So I want to pick a number x that makes this blue function equal to 1. So I can just sort of slide around uh, and I kind of just look at the X value th that I get when the Y value is equal to one. And I get my fingers too big to do it exactly, but I'm getting, 
you know, roughly 2.73. And if I look at the, you know, standard value of E, uh, 2.71828, so, so out to two decimal places, it'd be like 2.72. And so I had 2.73, but I also didn't quite have the right Y value either. So that's, I hope, like, uh, helps clarify to you like the relationship that, that this really does work to, to do that stuff. Oh, and by the way, <laughs> this blue function should look familiar, right? So what if I graph y equals natural log of x? It's the same. So you can take this to be the definition. Switching gears a little bit. We had talked about, it feels like a long time ago, but we did talk about inverse trig functions. Uh, we even opened up the course with this, remember with like uh, drawing the pictures of the right triangles and then ultimately we used that to find um, derivatives of inverse trig functions using implicit differentiation. And so what was it like? The derivative of inverse sine was something like uh, one over root one minus x squared. And so you can turn this into an integral formula like the antiderivative of one over root one minus x squared is now going to be uh, arc sine or inverse sine plus a constant, which now means that by the fundamental theorem of calculus, uh, you could write some Well, I'll phrase it like this. So let's take the integral from zero to x of one over uh, square root one minus t squared dt. So using this information, please fill in the, the right-hand side of the equation. So take a minute. Please fill in the right-hand side of the equation. What do you get? After giving you a moment, you take that antiderivative, right? You take that antiderivative, which was arc sine of t, and now you're evaluating it from zero to x. And then when you plug in x, you'll get arc sine of x. And when you plug in zero, you'll get zero. So you get this nice, these, these are called integral formulas you get this nice integral formula that sine inverse of x is equal to the integral from zero to x of one over one minus t squared dt. Which I think is really neat. And you can kind of, in some sense, like see the Pythagorean theorem in that formula. And you can do this for all of the other uh, six trig functions. I'll show you the corresponding one for, for secant. So you can take, I think it's actually a good exercise to go back and remember how to do this. 
like the derivative of secant inverse is one over absolute value of x square root x squared minus one. And therefore, uh, therefore an antiderivative of the right hand side. is equal to secant inverse of x plus c and therefore the corresponding integral formula would be that the integral from zero to x of absolute value t root t squared minus one dt is equal to um, Secant of x minus secant of zero. Secant is what? Is, is secant of zero equal to, to zero? Secant is like one over cosine. So um, and this should be secant inverse. So one over cosine zero is equal to one. Um, maybe we should be integrating this from, from one to x. Yeah, let's integrate this like I'm, um, you know, this, this, t equals to zero is probably not great. So let's integrate this from one to x and then make this secant inverse of, of one. And I think this should be equal to zero because, because secant of zero is equal to one. So the secant inverse of one should be equal to zero. That's what I get for not Preparing for class a little bit better, but let's the computer algebra system can test me. So secant of zero is equal to one. And so secant inverse of zero of one has to be equal to zero. So you do have to be a little bit careful when you're um, calculating an integral that has a like singularity in the denominator like that. Uh, uh, we have really good explanations when the integrand is continuous, but like when the integrand is running off to infinity, like when t equals zero, it's a little bit more difficult. And the fundamental theorem of calculus may not apply because there's a hypothesis to fundamental theorem of calculus that that you need to have, you know, the, the one that we used was that the integrand really need, did need to be uh, continuous. Okay, cool, but, but whatever. So we've got this integral formula for a secant inverse. And I would challenge all of you to write down integral formulas for, for all the other four trig functions. And I would also challenge you as you're reviewing to make sure that you can complete or, or demonstrate, not just memorize the formulas, but demonstrate why it's true, um, the like, derivatives of sine inverse x, tangent inverse x, secant inverse x, like whatever, like for, for all three of them. There's a list of those derivatives on page 347 in your book. So this opens you up to some more problems.
x squared is equal to 2x, so the derivative of 4x squared minus 1 is equal to 8x. So you might be able to use a substitution rule there. And th there's a natural substitution that comes to mind, which is u equals 4x squared minus 1, which would give you du equals 8x. And then you would proceed and, and try to solve the problem. Uh, let's circle back to that. When you're doing substitution rule, of course, you can do uh, any substitution you want. And it's an open question whether it'll make your problem easier or not. But the thing that I want to focus in on right this moment, just because we're, we've been talking about it, is there, there's a natural substitution to make, uh, namely u equals 2x, because then this becomes like 4 times x squared is equal to 2x quantity squared, isn't it? So this would become u squared minus 1, and the 1 over x will be taken over by, well, what will happen to the 1 over x? I don't know, maybe it'll just, maybe nothing. <laughs> well, let, let's see what happens. So if, if I take u equals 2x, and du would then be equal to 2 times dx it's derivative. Yeah, so what happens here? Um, when I do this substitution, substitution with bounds means I should be going from u of 1 over root 2 to u of 1, and then 1 over x times square root of u squared minus 1, and then uh, dx becomes 1 half du, so 1 half du. Of course, I've got a mixed variables in there that's bad. So like, how do I account for the x? Well, definitely, since I've got linear equation here, if u is 2x, x is u over 2. So I'm going to rewrite this as x equals u over 2. I'm going to pull the, the, the 2 out giving me one fourth instead of one half and i'll get one over u square root u squared minus one du and looking at the bounds so this would now be what um u of one over root two becomes two over root two and u of one becomes two And you might think that this does not, um, so let's see, is there is anybody else having an audio problem? I've got one message, there's an audio problem. Can anybody hear me okay? Okay, looks like it's, looks like it's working now. And so the reason why, so the reason why this is actually good is because um, we were just talking about uh, like like integral formulas for um, inverse trig functions. So, in fact, this looked like uh, the formula for inverse secant, right? Um, so that is to say, it looks like inverse secant of u was an antiderivative of one over absolute value of u times root u squared minus one. Of course, when you're going from two over root two to two, you're in a region where u is positive anyway. So u is of course equal to its own absolute value in that case. And your answer there can be one fourth times secant inverse of u evaluated from two over root two. Oh, so I wrote down secant squared, but I meant to write down secant inverse, excuse me. So this is going to be like one fourth secant inverse of two minus secant inverse of two over root two.
and you can do some, you know, you, you can do some trigonometry and reason this out. And you're supposed to realize that, that the sega inverse of two is equal to pi over three, and sega inverse of two root two is equal to pi over four. And this kind of makes sense because remember a secant is like one over cosine and cosine of, is it cosine of pi over three is equal to one half? So secant inverse of two would be um, pi over three. And similar argument for this one. Okay, well, yeah, let me restart the audio. Is it uh, better now? Okay, cool. Yeah, this microphone may be, uh, yeah, here's the, the microphone. It may be kind of uh, giving up on me. So I'll, I'll try to find another solution for Wednesday. I just think that's really interesting. So I think this is really um, cool substitution. So be on the lookout for, uh, you know, not just integrate the derivative and get the answer, but integrate something where if you work a little bit, um, like make a quick substitution, then you can then find yourself an inverse trig function and do it. But what about, so there, there was our answer. One, fourth um, pi over three minus pi over four. What about this other substitution? I don't have anything prepared for it. I'm just curious. Like, what if you did this? What if you said u is equal to 4x squared minus 1? And then du was now equal to 8 x dx like nothing stops you from doing that substitution rule doesn't tell you what you can and can't do so you would go from u of one over root two to u over one like whatever that is and then you're doing one over i'll leave the x like it is for now and this is square root of u and uh So what is it? Um, dx is equal to one over eight x du. So I could do one over du. And so now I get a true statement, but I get this problem with, I've got an x squared. So I'll have to handle that. I'll pull out the constant one eighth, and then I'm plugging in one over root two into u gives me uh, four over two minus one, and they give me one. Plugging in the number one simply gives me four minus one is three. And then I get one over x squared. Root u du, and so I can solve for x squared now. That's actually not so bad. I'm solving for x squared, u minus one is equal to four x squared, and therefore u minus one over four it's equal to x squared, so I can do something like 1 eighth, 1 to 3, 1 over u minus 1 over 4, root u. and multiply it so this this one over four is the same thing as multiplying by four so i can change that to four over eight so it's now back to one half integral from one to three one over u root u minus root u 
So this is now um, one half integral from one to three. Um, u times root u is like u to the three halves. So minus u to the one half. So I get this uh, integral, which is totally valid. It's equal to what I started with. Um, I don't know how to do it off the top of my head. Well, actually, I mean, I have an idea. I could probably use the another substitution, like w equals u to the 1 half, and then try to do partial fractions. It's like another technique, but like it's just like more and more work, and it's not clear whether it'll work out. Um, so that's just maybe like a like a cautionary tale that like you can try lots of different things, but you're not guaranteed to just um, have a pleasant time. Although this look this looks sort of pretty enough to me that I can't imagine that I that you wouldn't eventually be able to do it with more integration techniques. But this is a problem that is sort of crying out to be done with a substitution that that like gives you like inverse secant. And this substitution that I chose here is a little bit inelegant. It's still totally correct. But I wasn't able to quickly use it to find an answer. So that's just sort of like the, a frustrating thing. And the beautiful thing about mathematics is that it, you, you can really go in, in any path and make any statements that you want as long as each statement follows from the next. But the part of mathematics that requires creativity and ingenuity is sort of like figuring out which way you want to go and like how to, how to make your solutions elegant. So that's, that's sort of a, an advertisement for the creative part of math. Okay, so any questions or comments? All right, the last thing that I want to do today, I hope you got my message that I posted on the Google Classroom um last night and so uh, it's about course evaluations so they're going to be online this year and i posted a link on the google classroom and i'll i'll just put it here for you oh yeah i got a question is there a good way to choose that function u. Uh, unfortunately, no. Uh, th there's no procedure that's going to guarantee you a good choice for u. You really just have to use your own creativity and knowledge. And um, a good choice of u will depend on the fact that you already know a lot of derivatives. So you'll be seeking a substitution that makes the integrand look like the derivative of something so that you'll be able to then integrate it. So that, that's right. There's no way to, to directly choose you. So here's that link for course evaluations that you can also find on, on the Google Classroom. Uh, and so I'm going to set aside 10 minutes of class time today for you to click on that link and uh, fill out your evaluation for the course. So uh, after you click on the link, uh, you will select uh, Math 210, that's Calculus 1, that's our course, and then you'll fill out the corresponding questions. It should take five to ten minutes. Uh, of course, you can do this uh, anytime, but we love to see 100% participation, and the reason for that is if you get 100% of your students participating, then you know that you haven't left any voices out. And we really don't want to leave any voices out. We want everyone to be heard. Um, so I, I hope that you'll all take uh, some time to fill out the course evaluation. And I invite you to take the time right now to 
um, to do that. Uh, if there's any technical problems with filling out the form, um, unfortunately, I can't directly help you with that. That would that would somehow be a conflict of interest. But but if there's if there's any problems filling out the form, I invite you to contact the the registrar's office, like Academic Affairs. So. Um, you know, Peter Wong or, or Heidi or Susan Miller will will help you out there. But but I've clicked on it myself, and hopefully you can just click on it and answer the questions, and there will be no problem. So any final questions, comments, anything at all? All right, so I'll, I'll leave you to fill out that review and I'll come back on Wednesday prepared to uh, do a, a review of the course for you. And, and you can help me out by um, thinking of your own questions, anything that's troubling you mathematically, uh, any questions at all, you are welcome to ask them and we will discuss those questions and uh, I'll answer them to my best of my ability. Then we'll do our synchronous final exam from 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. on Friday. So we're close to the end, everybody. Thank you for your time and attention as usual, and have a great day.